Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Welcome to the September 15th meeting of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics. We have a single speaker today, Herbert Sauro, who I think is known to many of you already, uh, who's going to be talking about dynamics and sensitivity of signaling pathways, which is a topic we've heard addressed by a number of speakers in different contexts. As always, I need to remind you that the meeting is recorded and live streamed on YouTube. So be aware that uh, these are archived. Boy. Good way to start my meeting is mess up the, mess up the screen. Uh, uh, we have Tom Helicard, myself as leads. We appreciate your input. We're always available to take your suggestions and comments. Jim Sluka. Uh, Lorenzo and Joel are always there too to address uh, activities, ideas, presentation, anything that you would like. We're always there to help. We have our variety of communication channels. Uh, we would love to have a bigger audience for the great talks that we have and both when they happen and afterwards. We have our growing archive of seminars, which is really quite valuable, I think. Uh, please help us out. And we definitely would like to have help getting the uh, website improved and in terms of suggesting future speakers. We do have a Twitter account, MSM Viral. Uh, if you can help us use that, that might help us uh, build community. Are there any uh, announcements today that people would like to make before we get started? We're going to have our steering committee meeting tomorrow morning at 11, as usual. Uh, if you think you should be invited and you haven't received an invitation, let us know and we'll make sure that you have the invitation. Are there any other announcements uh, going forward? <clears throat> Okay, we have two open slots uh, for seminars. Uh, we would really appreciate your help uh, coming up with names. I know it's been a holiday and people have been uh, not thinking about this. So uh, now's a good opportunity to think about the people you'd like to hear from. Uh, Lorenzo and Joel are very efficient at getting people to say yes. So, uh, you can be uh, brave in your suggestions of who you would like to hear. So please do help us uh, create uh, a series for the fall that will be of interest to people. And we do have our tiny URL for a Google form to suggest speakers. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier, or you can email any of us with your ideas. Uh, feel free to suggest yourself, your graduate students, your postdocs, people whose papers you've read, anything that you would like. Even if you've spoken before, you're welcome to come back and speak again about new results or additional material. This is a community. James, anything from your trip that we might benefit from learning that you could do one of those presentations or part of one on the VPHI trip? I, I could probably present some of the things that were discussed at VPH uh, last week. So vir Virtual Physiological Human had their annual meeting last week in Porto. Uh, that meeting uh, had as its headline topic, uh, building medical digital twins. Uh, in fact, the amount of direct digital twin discussion was fairly limited. Uh, they did have a number of people from the EU uh, uh, agencies uh, who were talking especially about data sharing, standardization and data access. Uh, there was a lot of interesting discussion on validation of models and the use of computation in medicine. Uh, they have uh, some very big programs going on in uh, high-performance high computing, exascale computing. Um, so I think uh, I certainly could talk about a little bit, but it might be better to have Lisbeth come back and talk. She said she'd be happy to do that. Okay, so, thank you. Yep. So I don't want to take more time from Herbert. Uh, we don't do elaborate introductions here. Herbert is going to be talking to us about 
uh, signaling pathways, and I will turn the share over to him. Okay, thank you very much, um, James, for this invitation and to the, the, those other one, those other people who contacted me. Um, so I've been interested in uh, signaling networks for many years, um, but I always found them really difficult to uh, understand. This is part of a talk I gave uh, a couple of months ago. I was in Hawaii. Um, I gave a short talk. Um, some of this is from that short talk. And in fact, that's the type, this is the title I had then at that time. Um, so um, let's see. So yeah, um, let me move some of these things. Okay, so so I thought we'd make this a little bit interesting by making my, so by making some controversial statements. So it'll be a bit more fun for you. Um, and so I so for the fun of it, I I got this triangle with an exclamation point on it. So when you see that, you know I'm making a controversial statement, and I know they're a little bit controversial because I've had pushback in the past from them. So uh, anyway, I thought we might have a bit of fun while we talk about this. So. Let's see, let's move on to one. Okay, so I'm going to give the acknowledgements first. Uh, and this work has been going on for a long time, but in recent years, I've joined forces with Steve Wiley at PNL. Some of you may know, Song Fan, who also works at um, PNL. Steve Andrews, you may know, he is the author of Smolden, and uh, he has a secret interest in uh, dynamics of networks, and he's actually really good good at this kind of thing. And then Michael uh, Koshan, he's a postdoc with me working with Steve Wiley. And he's been, with that project he's on, he's trying to develop, um, how can we develop methods to, to create models that are predictive and trustworthy? And uh, as part of that, he's just got a paper coming out on um, how to generate benchmark models. So one of the things we want to do is we need to create, we need to, Create a set of benchmark models that we can test algorithms against. So he's got a he's produced a very nice package in Python that generates uh, reaction networks with all sorts of different properties that you can use for benchmarking. Uh, and Steve Wiley, he's probably the world's expert on EGFR and EGF pathways in mammalian cells. Uh, he's been working on it for like forty odd years, so he knows more about it than probably anybody I know. And he does a lot of wet lab work, but he's also a bit of a modeler as well. And, and so we've been thinking about, you know, how can we understand how networks work and how to rationalize them? Because at the moment they're just big, well, I'll show you a picture of what they look like. They look like that, okay. And how do you rationalize something like that? Um, that's basically the question. Because if you can rationalize it, then maybe you can, uh, in terms of um, cancer, at least come up with more objective ways to control these kinds of networks to try to subdue tumors um, yeah, you know, in patients. Um, I mean, one way, of course, you could throw AI at this. Maybe it comes up with something, but I'm, I'm still a mechanistic-based person, and I'm really interested in you know, how these things work and how you could control them. So I'm going to switch to something now. So a controversial slide coming up. Um, this picture here is the M1 chip. If you've got an Apple and you're one of the new Apple laptops, you'll have one of their new ARM chips in it. Um, they've really leapt ahead in uh, chip technology. They, you'll see uh, they've built the GPU into the main processor. They've also got a neural engine and all sorts of things. And I managed to get these, to, this is a, a die of one of the one of the early ones, uh, but they got a whole series of them now. And if you look on the right, I got this from uh, Wikipedia. They got the, the transistor count of these chips. So the, M, the original M1 or the A14, I guess is 11.8 billion transistors. The M1 Ultra has 114 billion transistors. I mean, this is an astounding level of complexity. I mean, yes, there are sections of the chip which are just cache, and so there's a lot of repeating units, but there's a lot of non-repeating units in, in these chips these days, especially with the neural engine, the GPU, and, this, and the central processing unit. I mean, 114 billion transistors just blows my mind. I mean, I mean the earliest, the first, microprocessor had about 4,000 transistors in it, I think. So we've come a long way. So the controversial statement is, okay, so you know humans can deal with this level of complexity, right? 
114 billion transistors that work perfectly for years on end, yet a cell only has about 500 to 1,000 kinases. So what is the issue we have here? Um, this seems a lot simpler than one of these modern day chips. I mean, there's all sorts of things you could say about that. And I wrote an article, must have been 15 years ago, for the scientist pointing this out. And, you know, why why is it that uh, we can deal with these things of this complexity, but we can't handle something with 500 or 1,000 kinases? Um, and I got all sorts of flack for that from letters are written to the editor. It was a, it was a, it was a fun, fun uh, article I wrote and to see what responses I get. I think ultimately there's a still a, a theme of vitalism running through biology, meaning, you know, biology is special and uh, maybe we will never understand it, but anyway. Uh, so if you look at the uh, if you look at one of the simplest microprocessors, this is the 6502. This is from years back in the 70s. Um, there's a resurgence in interest in called retro computing in these early microprocessors. Somebody reverse engineered the 6502 by actually taking one of the chips and cutting the top off, and then using a microscope to reverse engineer it. And uh, this is what it looks like on the right. You can zoom in on the left. You can see you know you can see all the individual transistors. It looks very complicated. Um, how do we deal with this level of complexity? Well, the way that engineers do it anyway is they abstract, they abstract, and they abstract at many, many levels. So you have here basically individual transistor, uh, which can be described in terms of, you know, um, uh, solid state physics, and then you can construct uh, basic gates, and that's described in terms of basic logic. And you can turn those gates into a higher order thing. This is a half order. I think I've got that right. You start talking about binary arithmetic, then you have a full ladder, which is a more complicated binary arithmetic. Then you put many of these things together. This is a Z80 uh, diagram. You get a higher level of description again, and then you end up with a piece of plastic. And um, you know, that piece of plastic, you, it's really actually really straightforward to work with, right? And all this the complexity has been has been abstracted away essentially. So you're dealing with this piece of plastic here, you've got this chip, you're really dealing with a very high level view of what's going on. And you don't have to worry about all the details. So this is how humans deal with this complexity. And when you've got 118 billion transistors, I mean, there's no way you can understand it in its totality. You have to abstract somehow, okay? And it's not just with digital systems, you can do up the abstraction uh, with analog systems too. And I mentioned analog because that's probably perhaps more like what nature uses rather than digital, although it's probably some kind of hybrid. But here, this is an op amp. This is a 741 op amp. Um, I can't remember how many transistors it's got in there, but it looks complicated. But in the end, you can actually break this down into various units. So. In red at the top, you've got these so-called um, current mirrors. They're basically for controlling um, current irrespective of voltage. You've got in blue, you've got a differential amplifier because the op amps have two inputs. So you amplify the difference between the inputs. Uh, in green, you've got a level shifter. In cyan, you've got the output stage, the drivers for the output. And then you've got a, in pink, you've got um, uh, an amplifier. So you can actually rationalize this kind, you know, these things if you break it down and abstract it to higher level features. So could we do something like that with uh, biological systems? And I'm not saying there's any, I'm going to give a solution or anything. It's more, this is more of a provocative talk. I got some, some ideas that I can give you. But the big pushback often that one hears is, you know, and it's a valid one, this one is, of course, now, you know, natural systems are evolved, right? Those microprocessors have been designed. They've been, they're understandable because they've been designed. We can only design things if we can understand what they're doing. And so it's, they've been specifically modularized like that. Because natural systems are not designed unless you, you know, unless you're, um, uh, intelligent designer, of course, They're, but most of us don't believe they've been designed. And so how can you, you know, reverse engineer them? Because they've evolved, right? And they're a natural system. They're not like a microprocessor, you know, or are they like a microprocessor? Um, and, and for me, um, leaning on what we know about man-made devices can be very useful. And this is another controversial point, right? 
some people don't like the idea of comparing man-made devices with natural systems because they think they're completely different but when you look at natural systems you see a lot of things that appear to have been re that man has you know invented that look very similar to the things we find in um natural systems uh, at the high level this is pretty obvious the eye the ear the brain muscles and so on we see you know similar things in man-made devices uh, the question comes whether you can do that kind of thing at the molecular level, right? Now, I will admit straight away, um, there isn't a perfect match between biology and man-made devices, and I'll come back to that later on. And this really does put a bit of a wrench in this idea. But you can go so you can you can take this, you know, to a certain level, but then you have to start thinking of of new ideas. So, so the question is, where do we start? Well, if you go back to the abstraction, the original abstraction I had with the with the microprocessor, we started off with transistors. Okay, so maybe we should start with well, what are the elemental processes in signaling networks? I mean, there are there are a limited number of things that signaling networks do at the at the at the very fundamental level, such as phosphorylation, you know, phosphorylating proteins, dephosphorylating proteins. Proteins binding to form complexes or sequestering proteins, you know, hiding them. Uh, you also have degradation and you have protein synthesis. Now, degradation and protein synthesis is actually something we don't tend to find in man made devices, i.e., you don't see a microprocessor that's trying to destroy a transistor or create a new one. So, that's one new aspect we have in biology, and that's probably related to rewiring. So, um, a lot of differences between cancer cell lines, for example, is due to re rewiring of, of, of the proteins. We do have a, a fixed repertoire of proteins, but they tend to be rewired in different ways, depending on what cell type you're looking at. And the whole thing can be rewired under different conditions through degradation and protein synthesis. So that's the first unique thing we see in natural systems compared to man-made. We don't tend to rewire man-made devices um so anyway so we have these basic processes that we can talk about um and from these basic processes one thing that we find very common in signaling networks are these cycles these phosphorylation cycles so you have a protein a that gets phosphorylated form protein ap and then that gets dephosphorylated these are very very common and when i mentioned the 500 to 1000 kinases at the beginning most of them do this kind of thing okay and you can get multiple phosphorylation as well, not just single phosphorylation. So these appear to be perhaps basic behavioral units. Okay. Now it's interesting. One thing you can do is you can turn it around. Uh, hold on, I want to turn it. Let me turn it around first. I'm going to then I'll go back to the side. So here's a controversial slide. You can turn it on its turn it uh, 90 degrees, and you can sort of map it to a transistor actually. So the kinase becomes the base, the collector output becomes, well, the collector output from the collector, and the power coming in is basically ATP. Now, the reason I say that there's some match here is because if you look at the dynamics of the kinase, of these phosphorylation cycles, at least under one regime, they look very much like the response of a transistor. Um, so these, this is from uh, that paper, that uh, the review paper that uh, was mentioned. There's at least three behave four sorry four behaviors you can get out of this simple little cycle. Um, the one that we're most familiar probably with is the third one, the sigmoidal behavior, and that matches to some degree what a transistor does. The other ones uh, are hyperbolic. The first the first one we just get simple hyper hyperbolic ones. But two that may be less familiar with you is threshold behavior. So nothing happens, then suddenly a lot happens. And then the one on the end, uh, which I was unaware of this until we wrote the review, where you can actually get linear behavior. So as the as you increase the kinase, so all the x-axis is the kinase, the y-axis is the is the phosphorylated protein. As you increase the kinase, you get a linear increase in um, AP. And these behaviors can be generated just by setting the, the relative KM values for the kinase and the, and the phosphatase, okay? But it is interesting that um, the third one, the sigmoid response, does look very much like a transistor. And if you think about it, I mean, there are only so many behaviors 
things can have. And it's perhaps it's not surprising that uh, nature does show in many cases um, sigmoid behavior, which is reminiscent of, of a transistor. It's also reminiscent of an r pump too, actually. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we can get to this, this point and after that it all falls apart. <laughs> Um, so this is this is pretty much as far as most people have got uh, with trying to rationalize networks. I'll show you one thing that we think is pretty certain what a higher level thing is, but we're writing a paper at the moment, uh, Steve Wiley and uh, ourselves, and uh, we're going to try and rationalize the entire EGF pathway um, based on, on, an, on a high level abstraction. Um, and then we've got rules and to, and I, I can't tell you about this stuff because it hasn't been published yet, but we have rules and to decide where a unit starts and where a unit ends. Uh, but anyway, um, let me tell you about some things that have already been published. Um, what have we got then to study uh, these networks? I mean, electrical engineers have, you know, built up a whole suite of stuff they can use. They've got CAD programs or design and simulation, but they've also got a, a huge uh, amount of theory. Um, and these are based on some basic physical processes like uh, on the top left or the top right there, we have Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law. And then on the bottom right, we've got Kirchhoff's voltage law. And they combine those together with the properties of resistors and capacitors. And they can, they can they have a theory, basically small signal analysis theory, for which they can use to understand and design electrical networks. Now we have something actually really similar, it turns out. We have simulation programs, right? Lots of them. We also have the equivalent of Kirchhoff's current law because of mass conservation. And those of you who know a bit of thermodynamics will probably come across detailed balance. That's effectively our Kirchhoff's voltage law. So we have similar things and in fact it's so similar we can even do a small signal analysis okay and i'm not going to delve into this theory too much um i've got a whole battery of references at the end that you can look up if you're interested um there is a small signal analysis of networks um basically it starts off just briefly starts off at the top left with the basically the dynamics equations, which is the stoichiometry matrix times the, the rate vector. That's all that is. And then you can linearize this. So small signal analysis basically means taking the system of ODEs and then linearizing and then ending up with the transfer functions. And if you do that, you will end up with transfer functions. Okay. Um, so N here then is the stoichiometry matrix. And then you have these linearized uh, terms, dV by dx and dV by dp. P is the, uh, in the inputs or parameters you have the system and X are the state variables. So just an example, you can take a simple gene circuit like this where you have a signal coming in, stimulates the expression of protein X and, that, get, and then that, that, that degrades. You can write down the stoichiometry matrix. You can write down this dV by dx, matrix in this case happens to be a column and you can in this case i've only got one input which is going to be r and so i can write that down and r only affects v1 so i only end up with i'm assuming linear mass action kinetics you can do this you can plug all these into this transfer function and you'll end up with a transfer function those of you who've done transfer function will immediately recognize that as a first order transfer function right um what's nice about these transfer functions is uh, those of you who know about any some control theory, these are functions of the of uh, the frequency s, or you we usually change s to j omega, which is the frequency. It turns out that at zero frequency, these transfer functions turn into sensitivity measures. So you can actually figure out how sensitive every point, uh, how sensitive the state variables are with respect to any perturbations in any part of the network based on these transfer functions. Okay. All right. Um, so we have we have simulation technology. We have that the law. There's a number of you on this call who have your own tools for this. We have, we have no problems there. There is theory. Uh, it's just maybe not as widely known. Uh, it's, it's more widely known in Europe than it is here in the states. Um, and so you could do small signal small signal analysis. So. For example, and I'm not going to delve too much into the theory here, just to show you some results. Let's say you have, and these are published by other people and myself. 
let's say you have a cascade, and you often find these in signaling networks, a cascade of phosphorylation cycles. Um, and you can, you can do a small signal analysis of these systems. And it turns out you can define um, a little r, this is the sensitivity of how a downstream phosphorylated protein responds to changes in, in, a, in a phosphorylated protein in a layer above it. And you can define that, uh, you can work out what that sens sensitivity is. And then it turns out that the overall sensitivity from the signal all the way down to the bottom of the cascade is just the product of all those terms, okay? And so if each, if each unit has you know, a gain greater than one, then you end up with a product you know, where all the gains are greater than one, you end up with a very large gain, right? So this, you can do things like that. You can, uh, and you can rationalize how, where this gain comes from um, and so on. Um, the other thing you can do is, now, the other thing you can do, so this is a signal coming in. This could be, you know, EGF coming in, stimulating production of ERK at the end. But the other thing that's of interest is um, how therapeutic drugs act. And they often act by changing the total protein concentrations. What you have to imagine here, let's say we go to the first cycle, S1, S1 to P1, that mass is effectively fixed over a short term time period. If we assume protein expression and protein degradation is small compared to the cycling rates, you can assume that the total mass in each of these cycles is fixed, okay? And what a drug does, it effectively disturbs that total mass. So you can do the same signal analysis now, but with respect to the total mass. So you may have a, a therapeutic drug that affects the first cycle or the second cycle, third cycle and so on. And you can write down how that how perturbing each of these individual cycles will have an effect on, say, the uh, the end point of the cycle. So you can do all these kinds of analysis on how different perturbations affect different parts of the of the of the network, and you can rationalize that and find out how each component contributes to that uh, perturbation. So this goes back to the the abstract I had I had at the beginning. I read that abstract when it was up, and one thing I mentioned in the abstract is this. Um, I mean, a drug is, has two effects. One, it has to bind to the protein that you're actually targeting. But the second thing that has to happen is that that perturbation in that protein has to perturb, perturb, has to propagate to the rest of the network to have an effect on the phenotype. So you have to have both, both in place. And if, if you don't have one of them, then your drug isn't gonna be very effective. And the only way around it is to administer large amounts of drug with the, you know, with all the, the side effects you get from that. So the idea is um, the protein engineers would, would design drugs that have, that can bind effectively to a protein, have an effect on a protein, but the small signal analysis would tell you then whether if you were to disturb that protein, will it have any effect on the phenotype? Right? And that's where the small signal analysis comes in. Now, the big story though is in a lot of these pathways, they, a lot of them have this mysterious negative feedback wrapped around them. You can imagine you have a stack of these and most of these are amplifying. So if you have a whole stack of them, the amplification is quite significant between the input and output. But then you discover that nature slaps a negative feedback around it, which doesn't, you know, initially doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why it have all this gain and then you kill it by putting a negative feedback around it. And I remember talking to a control engineer many, many years ago in a back, well, 2004 or something. And he said, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I would do. And if I were a designer, I would do that as well. And he said, yeah, I would do it if I wanted an amplifier. It turns out you can write down for this little system here, I've just got two layers of the negative feedback. You can write down the effect that the signal has on the output P2. So this is our, this is our P2S. And I can write it in terms of all the little sub, the sub sensitivities. So R1, R21, for example, is how um, P1 affects uh, P2. And R1S, for example, tells me how S affects P1. The important one is this P2, P1, this uh, 2 on 1, or this, this one R12, rather. This is the feedback term, all right? So that's how strong the feedback is in affecting the first step. 
if I were to make the feedback really, really strong, you effectively end up with this approximation. And you'll notice that the, the, the sensitivities within the cycle have disappeared and you only end up with the feedback cycle, the feedback um, sensitivity and how sensitive the signal input signal is itself. So this is a classic case of a negative feedback amplifier. So when you have an op amp, which has also has a high gain, you wrap a negative feedback around it, this is exactly what happens. Basically, all the guts inside the amplifier no longer become important. And all that matters is the, the feedback itself and the input to the um, amplifier. And you end up with a, a, a really nice linear relationship between the output signal and the input, because that's basically what you want in an amplifier. And you can run simulations of this uh, with a simple system like that, with and without feedback. So this is with no feedback is the dotted one. You see it's got a very high gain, very steep. The minute you put feedback in, you get a beautiful straight line, right? It basically linearizes the, the, uh, the nonlinear response. Um, so this goes then, so this goes back to a figure we had in the review. These are various um, things you can do with negative feedback. And the one thing here you can do is if you have a negative feedback around the map kinase pathway, you basically essentially end up with a linear amplifier. Um, there's an actually growing body of evidence to show that this is the case. Um, Steve Wiley has a lot of experimental data that shows this, and I'm trying to persuade him to publish this, and I think we might put it in the next paper. But he has shown really clearly that there's a linear relationship between ERK and RAF. It's a straight line, okay? It's re really... Um, very clear. The other thing, there's another set of experiments that somebody else has done where they perturb the components inside the feedback and there's no hardly any effect whatsoever. This is exactly what you would predict if you uh, if the map kinase were acting as a, as a negative feedback amplifier, right? Because in this equation here, you see all the innards have disappeared and all you're left with is the feedback and the input. So, we propose that the, the map kinase cascade with the negative feedback is acting as a classic negative feedback amplifier. Okay. Now, feedback can do other things as well. We've got to cut just a couple of two, two things here. Uh, the first one is maintaining constant outputs, um, for example, ATP and glycolysis or amino acid biosynthesis are examples of that. And another one, which is a very newish one from uh, Mustafa Kamash, is a uh, was in Europe, Zurich now, used to be in San Diego. Um, but he's shown that you can use negative feedback to form these um, integral controllers that give you perfect adaptation. There's a lot of things you can do with feedback, uh, which we sort of briefly touch on in this review. The thing that's of particular interest to us is to rationalize this, the reason why we have a negative feedback wrapped around the map kinase cascade, which when you first see it, doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Okay. All right. So, these are examples where we've used our existing knowledge of man-made control systems and, Im and imposed those ideas on natural systems, right? In some cases, that may, that may actually work. Um, but as I promised earlier, there are places where there isn't a good match. And one in particular, number two, which I'll talk about below, but first one is impedance effects due to sequestration. There's an awful lot of protein binding um, between, between sections of networks. So if you go back to, uh, I mean, this figure here, I mean, this hides something in the, and that is that P1 here, for example, is a kinase that phosphorylates S2 into P2. Now, what I don't show here is that the kinase actually binds to S2 in order to phosphorylate it. And so what effectively means is part of the mass in the upper layer is getting sequestered in the lower layer. And that happens all the way through the cascade. And if it happens throughout, throughout signaling networks, and that makes them a lot, lot more complicated to understand. If our Boris Kolodenko about uh, 15 years ago showed that if you had a double phosphorylated cycle, just one of these cycles, but with another one attached to it, and you took into account sequestration, 
you can actually see the emergence of two positive feed, two negative feedbacks, which result, which caused the system to become bistable. I mean, that was when I saw that paper, I was so shocked by that. I sort of dropped the whole idea of studying signaling networks because that was such a subtle effect. Um, it is due to the, the kinases, the phosphorylases competing for substrate, and they and you, and basically res, result in these sort of hidden feedbacks appearing, and that resulted then in bistability, which was totally um, unexpected. And so sequestration is the first thing that can have all sorts of side effects that we probably, as in man-made devices, we tend to eliminate. We don't like systems. When we attach two systems together in man-made devices, we don't like one system interfering with the operational characteristics of the system it's connected to, because that would make design very hard. But in biology, of course, it's, it's evolved and they don't care what happens so long as it works. Uh, we can get a lot of that, and that, that complicates things a lot. And this is this idea of retroactivity that Del Vecchio came up with some years ago. So that's one problem, right? Rampant sequestration which can complicate things the other one which is a lot more subtle is something called stochastic focusing um the other thing we do in man-made devices we try to eliminate noise right we don't like noise at all we try to get rid of it uh, but in nature that may not always be the case we're often dealing with small numbers of particles and they will elicit noise and of course if evolution finds aha i can use noise to make myself fitter it will and there's this thing, there's a, a problem with um, noise in biology. And that is, we know, we know, you know, protein concentrations are noisy. And the problem with that is this noise, so you have to think of this, we have this, this little plot here, of this axis here, the reaction rate versus um, substrate. If it's just a normal, say, hyperbolic curve, that's nonlinear, it has a curvature. If there's noise in the x-axis, the nonlinear nature of the curve will cause the, the noise that then propagates into the y-axis to be distorted. And uh, when that gets distorted, the, the, the stochastic, if you run a stochastic simulation and deterministic simulation, they will look completely different. It's not that one is noisy, a noisy version of the other, but you actually get qual qualitative differences in behavior. In this case, you notice that the, the, the mean rate, reaction rate, gets displaced and gets pushed down. And so that means downstream, downstream systems connected with the, to this will perceive a, a lower, lower average reaction rate, and that will cause concentrations downstream to be altered. And so you get this whole effect Due to, due to stochasticity, which you do not see in deterministic systems at all, and which in national systems we try to squash completely because it's just a horrible thing to try to deal with. And the theory for dealing with this is largely un, undone, not hasn't been developed properly, but uh, I suspect, you know, I mean, nature will do anything it wants to, to, to increase fitness, and it may well exploit stochastic fo focusing to do that. Okay, so that's... Basically, I've come to the end of it. Um, I mainly had a talk to give you some some thoughts about what we're up against. Um, I have a whole battery of uh, books and papers that may be of interest to, if if that if that's of interest to any of you. Uh, there's a couple of books there uh, that give you a lot of theory. Michael Savage, of course, did a lot of work back in the seventies. I mean, a lot of this is pretty old, although in, it's been modernized as well. But Michael Savage had a really nice book back in the uh, was it 19, 1973, 74, which is a mine of information in it, even if it's a bit old. Um, there's a bunch of papers. Uh, we got I got one paper that talks about the nonlinear signal processing by noise propagation. If you want to be scared, you can read that. Um, we have our review there. Uh, we Boris and I talked about this a long time ago some of the comparisons between natural and uh, man-made systems. And if you want to know more about uh, small signal analysis, there's a lot of literature there. Um, uh, some of the, this has a nice paper uh, from Illinois. Um, Christine Radio was the first to put this on a, on a sound theoretical footing. Um, there's a whole thing by Yanni Hoffmeyer, Metabolic Control in a Nutshell, and there's a more modernized version of Reda's work in uh, this paper, uh, General Formulation. 
Uh, I mean, it'd be nice if we could deal with um, the systems the way engineers deal with systems. I mean, we've got a few complications like with sequestration and noise, but it'd be nice if we had a solid theoretical framework around which we could talk about how systems behave rather than just relying on simulation, uh, which we tend to. Um, but anyway, that's that's it, I think. And I got the um, acknowledgments again. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. A lot to talk about. Floor is open for questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I would argue that a resistor is equivalent to a single copy of a protein <clears throat> and not to a gene. That the way you make a, a you know, a billion transistor device is you'd figure out one of them and just copy and paste. And that's what a CPU is, right? It's yeah, it is. the difference that's, that's between the a 32-bit yeah. CPU is just four 8-bit CPUs copy and pasted next yeah, to Yeah, actually, you're right. That's something I didn't mention. Yeah, every transistor is identical. Yeah. Uh, but nature can't do that because it's in, in a liquid phase, not a solid state phase. Although it's interesting to talk about scaffolding, of course. In yeah. Ways, but anyway, uncondensates, of course. But um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, because that makes design much simpler as well. Yeah. Um, and phosphorylation, basically, I mean, it, it's it's pretty well established that three quarters of all phosphorylation doesn't seem to do anything at all. Well, that that's an interesting. Uh, that's that's point, an actually. arguable point. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, that's a really good point because you see this all the time. I mean, a lot of proteins are multiply phosphorylated, and it doesn't see any point in it. But it seems there's um, some people have been looking at. Uh, now that alpha fold did its thing, you can look at all these protein structures, and it it may be that's what's happening is that the the multiple phosphorylations are just forming a face onto which things can bind. And the, and the more phosphorylations you have, the stronger the binding is. Um, so for some phosphorylation may be to elicit actual dynamic responses, and some phosphorylation may be there to uh, just form recognition sites for, for binding. I think another, another goal of phosphorylation is that there's no way in the cell to tell how old a protein is. There's repair mechanisms for DNA, but there's virtually no repair mechanisms for proteins. Yeah. Uh, so these random phosphorylation events might just be a timestamp. Yes. And it's known yes. that the the, yes. the, the, the proteolytic de degradation pathway is triggered by negative. Yeah, no, I mean, it's surprising there are a lot of fundamental so questions like that. You know, that are not it's, known. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. So the phosphorylation, all kinds of stuff, and that's just, you know, nature figures out something and then figures out 18 different things to use that something for. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. I wonder, have you ever thought about how this whole approach applies to steroid receptors? Because there you've got the situation of you get a certain load of steroid into the cell, which may be more than the number of receptors or less than the number of receptors. Yeah. Those receptors then bind to, you know, the DNA response elements in the genome and the, the DNA. Yeah. Yeah. But the number of receptors may be more or less than the number of response elements. And if it's less than the number of response elements, now you've got you know, there's 500 genes that should respond to this system, but we've only got 300 steroids in ah, the cell. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. Only 300 of them get to respond. Uh, yes, that's and a good. Those 300 uh, might uh, not always be the same. And even if you say, well, this site, you know, it, it's yeah. 0.1 kcal better binding at the level of a couple of hundred events, that makes absolutely no difference at all. I it's mean, this comes back to another idea choosing. from uh, from electrical engineering, where one circuit has to drive another circuit, and it's got enough current to drive it. Yeah, same yeah. thing. Basically, you're talking about that as well. Whether the expression of enough protein is enough to drive all those transcription sites. Yeah, uh, and there's a and if it's not, what does it do? Yeah. Them. So yeah. yeah, or not? Yeah, yeah. And that might be why when you do single cell uh, RNA analysis, they're all different. Yeah. It's because they're all actually just deploying some transcriptional element differently, transiently mm -hmm. perhaps, but. And you're back cool. to the other point about, you know, is all phosphorylation important? Is is all transcription binding important? Yeah. Mm. Yep. So, I mean, my, my call to arms is, you know, whether we could have a more quantitative you know, approach to how we deal with this kind of complexity. Uh, Should we re uh, uh, start a biospice again? <laughs> no. <laughs> Josh. <laughs>
Josh, next. Um, hi, I have, a, I have a question for you. So um, you mentioned that there are maybe like 500 to 1,000 kinases in a cell, right? Yeah, right. Um, and they're acting in an analog manner, yeah. but sort of digital in a way. And it could um, be some hybrid. I mean, who knows what they're doing? And, and, and so when you say some hybrid, I, I think of that, that seems like a quantum tech thing to me. And so do you have an idea of how many qubits in a quantum computer could effectively <laughs> no simulate idea. a cell? God, no, no, I have no idea, no. Okay. No, sorry, can't answer that one. It's um, a good, an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, it's probably is some kind of hybrid. As I said, I mean, evolution doesn't care what it does as long as it works. And there's probably some hybrid. I mean, we like things nice, clean and tidy so that we can understand them and engineer them. But nature doesn't have such restriction. So... Um, I mean, you didn't and, use and, the and word orthogonality as a concept, but I mean, as an engineer, you talk about orthogonality. Yes. And, and, and biological systems are the opposite of orthogon. Yeah. I mean, your example of ERC is a good one in the sense that a lot of the components that you've got in your pathway show up in five different pathways. Yeah, yeah. And people yeah, always yeah. draw one pathway at a time, yeah. but then the same molecules being used to do different yeah. things. And the and other thing we find out, is it's sequestered and doing other things. The other thing we find is a lot of parallel lines running down because there's multiple ERCs, multiple rafts. Yeah. What on earth is no. that thing? Yeah. No. Yeah. So no Occam's that. razor in, in biology. <laughs> right. Out the window. Okay, next, uh, Hiram. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I was wondering kind of more about that, uh, that 500 to 1,000 kinases statement. I yeah. was wondering, uh, I think it's important to distinguish between 500 and 1,000 possible kinases that could be in the cell at one time or how many there actually uh, are yes and i was i was wondering what your thoughts are on uh, about how many proteins can you have diffused throughout the cell at one time <laughs> relative to how fast you can be transcribing these genes uh relative to how you're transcribing these genes um is that, ask, ask that again well, I'm, I'm basically thinking about how many proteins can you really fit in the cell at oh, once? Yeah. Probably an informational limit. There. Oh, there's a finite number, definitely. Um, and that's an, yeah, that's an interesting question itself. And for bacteria, it's a particularly interesting question because they're really restricted. But uh, this is, and of course, for a large cell, you have diffusional issues, which is probably where these scaffolds come in and where uh, these condensates that people now like to talk about come in. I don't know the... Um, what the maximum density is. Um, do you want to look at some of good cells, David Good cells pictures? <laughs> You'll see how packed it is. I mean, proteins are roughly, I think, eight eight nano nanometers apart or something, or six nanometers apart on average. So uh, there isn't much space, actually, because you still need solvate, you know, you still need to have them in solution. So you have to have some layer of water between each protein. So, um, I mean, our eukaryotes, are not, mammalian cells are not so bad because they are pretty flexible, but bacteria have a real problem because they're rel relatively rigid cell walls. And uh, there's some interesting results, actually, an optimal distribution of enzymes given a fixed amount of protein. And there are, there are some interesting solutions to that problem. So, but I can't answer your immediate question, I'm afraid. Um, Reinhardt. Yeah, it was very thought provoking. Thank you very much. I'm wondering if you have um, any thoughts about how um, the things you talked about relate to this <clears throat> to this nebulous concept of modularity that always comes ah. up in biology. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, yeah, I mean, human devices are modular because that's what that makes them designable again. Okay, now the question is whether nature is modular or not. And if you're going to rewire, if rewiring occurs, you do probably want things to be modular. So the question has, uh, the question we ask is, is there an evolution? First of all, what do we mean by module, right? That's the first thing. So what we mean by module is something that's replaceable. You can take it out, put another thing in, and it looks as if nothing has changed. 
Okay, so at, at the phys at the organ level, I can take my heart out, put put somebody else's heart in, and I still work. Very modular. Okay, so that's what we mean by that's what we mean by modular. Now the question is: Is is there such a thing as modular modularity at the molecular level? Um, is there is there an evolutionary advantage to being modular at the molecular level? The only thing, one thing we we thought of was if you're going to rewire. You probably want modular units that have set behaviors that you can rewire to create. You, you want the same behaviors to be rewired, but in different ways to get new responses. You don't want a free for all where you connect two units together and they just interfere with each other and you have no idea what you're going to get. So um, it's very hard to find modules in, in uh, at the molecular level. Um, because we don't have many criteria to decide where the interfaces are. But one criterion is feedback. Because feedback naturally creates boundaries between systems. Um, the other thing is probably the, the amount of protein. So uh, large amounts of protein uh, probably also are boundaries between modules, possibly. Um, but yeah, it's a really good question. It's largely unanswered. Um, because why should biology be modular, first of all, at the molecular level? Is there an advantage? As humans, we see the advantage, of course. But in, in, does evolution have an advantage to making things modular? Mm. Great, well, thank you. Herbert, I mean, there were those famous experiments 20, 25 years ago that directed evolution in, in bacteria, where they showed that you can take protein A and replace it by a totally non-homologous protein that accidentally does the same thing. Oh, yeah. You can walk through the whole circuit and take out almost every protein in the bacteria and replace it with something that's totally different, and it still functions in the same way. <laughs> uh, so the, the particular molecules, there are a few molecules like ATP that really do something. Yeah. But most molecules biologically only have function in the sense that they happen to connect to other things. Yeah. So they're process definitions of what the molecule oh, is. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. The molecule yeah. itself doesn't do it. It's not that, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. ERK does something. Yeah. It's that ERK has a function and that anything that has the same function can be replaceable. Be equivalent, can be replaceable. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't have to be any, have any sequence homology to the thing uh, that yeah, you you're start right. with. Yeah, correct. And, yeah. And, and, and they could go very far. You could replace thousands of molecules yeah. in a bacterium and still have it work. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great, a great, so, so what you mean by module, I think is a subtle point. Uh, Do you have a reference for those things, James? Uh, look up Chris Rao, R-A-O. Oh, Chris Rao. I know Chris. He was at Urbana. I don't know. Yeah, where yeah, 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 yeah. My old thesis advisor did experiments on that. I don't know if they were. Yeah. Um, but it, but you can do a lot of substitution. Yeah. Um, Chang. Um, hi, Harvard. Good hi. seeing you again. Yeah. <laughs> so as I said, you know, can wait to early on that um, really, I think a lot of my work was kind of inspired by reading your articles like many years ago. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, things you were guys talking about the modularity of things and also the the comparison between the man-made devices like uh, electric circuits and uh, um, right molecular circuits. So I guess one thing we can point out that um, in this, although you like on an IC uh, a circuit, you can have billions of transistors, but in terms of complexity, uh, right, the, except the power, uh, the common line uh, the, or the earth line, they're connected, uh, but provide power, but, but one transistor transistor is usually connected to just a few of others. As opposed to in the biological system, one protein yeah. can really interact with oh, yeah. many, many others. Yep. So that's, yeah. it's a big, you know, challenge oh, a big difference. differences. Yeah, um, right. yep. yeah in, yep. in here. Yeah, and there's and, a major problem in signaling networks. Yeah. There's so much crosstalk apparently um, between things. Uh, be nice to know the strengths of all these crosstalks because we see them, but nobody knows how actually how strong they are. Um, but yeah, you that know, is a big difference. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Right, and when you when you have all these crosstalks, every model we're do, we're, we're we're working on in isolation starts to fail because of the leakage, whatever you call that, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
yeah mm. so uh <laughs> no that's a good point actually yeah yeah i mean uh, this makes this makes the system of course evolvable too if it wasn't a solid substrate you probably couldn't evolve it but because it's in liquid state nature can play around with new interactions really easily that's correct as well and um you know and, and yeah it probably makes it also evolvable yeah, and also these rewiring stuff, right? Either unwiring or rewiring, where, for example, with the protein DNA uh, interactions, if the DNA or the chromosome gets yes. uh, right uh, methylated or imprinted, then you don't have access to that. So that wiring is cut off, more or less yeah. like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Different uh, cell types. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so a, another, that's, yeah. yeah. Another question I meant to ask you on this, on your thought is, we're, you're talking about a lot of these, uh, these, these amplification and the logarithmic gains, right? Yep. So with, with, the, with the electric currents, these different currents they have both can be positive and negative. So you can add them up or subtract them. Oh, but yeah. with the molecular system, you always almost like you have to convert them into a log scale and uh, right. Especially yes. all these gains we're talking about is really unlock a percentage change. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Right. But but there, but even you do the log conversion, it's not exactly as the electrolytic system because you don't add concentration together, like right no. kind of A add to, to another kind of yeah, it's not exactly the same yet. No. Uh -huh. So that's a, some difference uh, that I'm also trying to struggle. To you can do you can do some arithmetic though. I mean, you can do multiplication with, by, by molecular. Right, definitely. You can also do subtraction. Actually, uh -huh. uh, A plus B goes to C. You can you can. Uh, um, yeah, with some flux conservation. Yes, with for the same species for the same protein, yeah. right? Uh -huh, different modification term, but then for complete different uh, ones, you cannot really. Uh -huh, Add them, subtract them. Even these two are interacting. Uh, yeah, yes. adding is a problem, maybe. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting idea, actually. What 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 arithmetic is or what computations are capable of basic reaction networks? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because you can't go negative, as you say. Either you don't have negative voltages. Yeah, uh -huh. which is another restriction. Yeah. Everything has to be in the positive quadrant. Mm. You've got two things that are important there. One is you point out. There, 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 there are two things that go in opposite directions at the beginning and then the third one, I guess. One, as you point out, every molecule reacts with every other molecule. When we draw arrows, we're thinking, we're identifying the things that we think are strong interactions. Mm. And there's the whole topic of random matrix theory, which asks the question, well, what are the eigenvalues of a, ra a matrix where you have some strong backbone and then weak, weak uh, random components? Yeah. And when can you ignore those weak random components? And the answer is, oh, it's a mess. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not obvious that you can neglect the weak interactions. The, the fact that the abstraction of a network works at all in biology is a bit surprising. The, the second one, of course, is that there's spatial segregation. Yeah. And so you know, two molecules are only going to interact if they're in the same place. Yeah. And, and you have a lot of compartmentalization. That's always this. You could have two cells that have identical chemical composition. They're totally different because their spatial organization is different. Yeah. So concentration by itself doesn't tell you what the cell is going to do. Yeah. And that's a concern. But, but then the other one that comes back to this, which I think you showed uh, in your very, actually quite early on when you added your negative, can you go back to the negative feedback uh, picture? So this, this is already an intractable problem. Uh, and it's an intractable problem because S and P2 are incoherent. And so you have to know how S and P2 signals combine. Now you could say there's a product, there's a subtraction, there's some averaging or something else. Oh, you mean at the, at the negative feedback itself? Right, so you have a positive yeah. amplification and a negative amplification. You have a negative signal coming in, a positive signal coming yeah. in. Now, in a logic gate, I say it's an AND gate, an R gate, or something else. Yeah. That's the way I combine those two signals. But biologically, when I have 10, you know, it's easy to draw, for example, for transcription factors. You, you have you know, promoter, it's a repressor, promoter, repressor, seven things coming in. But 
the, the, the rate of production of that gene is not a Boolean on those things. It's some very complicated function of those concentrations. And it's gonna be different depending on the details. Uh, in this case, you've made an assumption about how uh, S and P2 combine to promote the product, the, to, to change of V1F. But if you made um, an assumption about the way S and P two interact, actually, actually, yeah, no, I don't have to make any. I don't have to make any assumption how they work, other than, other than if I were to increase P two, what effect does it have on V one F? That's all I have but to are, know. Are you assuming they're independent? What P two and V one F? Are you assuming a product form that that that? Are you assuming a product form? Sorry, what do you mean? So I'm trying to say if I have S, if I want to know the rate of, at which S1 is converted to P1. Right. Okay. And that depends on S. S1. And it's an increase oh, yeah. function of S. Yes, correct. And it's a no of S, the input. S. Yes, S, yeah. And it's a and it's a decreasing function of P2. Correct. Okay. So the simplest thing is to assume that those are independent and the rate is a product of that increasing and decreasing function. Oh, oh okay. Um, but it's all signal analysis, it, it doesn't matter. Though. Very it could be some very complicated function of those. It could things. be, but when you're dealing with small small signal analysis, it doesn't matter. Right. So the, as long as you can linearize it, you're okay. Yes. Yes. But, but you don't. But in general, you can't linear. No. Correct. Well, I. And then the yeah. And then the functional form matters. If you're doing big and changes, the functional form matters definitely. And it, and then it's and 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 then then you get the fact that every, I mean, actually look in your textbook about the way to combine incoherent signals. And yeah. you have a, a half a dozen different functional forms for yeah. co combining incoherent signals. Yeah. Some of which occur in one place and some of which yeah. occur in another place, all of yeah. which have very different effects. For big changes, you've got a problem. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a good thing to start with, but I'm just no, saying- No, 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 I know. But unfortunately, you know- Why would you have an incoherent signal coming in? as a regulator, you have a problem because in logic, it's easy that, that yeah. if you have if you have two Boolean inputs, yeah, yeah. there are not that many possible outputs. No, no, no. But no, here no. there's an unlimited number of ways. No, no, it, it, it is a problem for big, yeah, big changes. Unfortunately, there's no mathematics we have to deal with that. I tell my students, it's, it's God's little joke on us. You, you let us deal with small changes, but not big changes. <laughs> so, yeah. Another, uh, while we're looking at this, right? So yeah. maybe, Herbert, uh, you can talk about um, if there's any like um, newer developments on these uh, notations. I know there's like SVGN notation, all those coming, right? Oh. Uh, yeah, like yeah. say, clearly when I teach this, I have to tell the students, you have to be able to differentiate what this arrowhead means. Some means flux, some means just regulation, yeah, no impact on the controller. I, my personally, I tend to use like open arrowheads represents is a flux. So you have a mass flux and yeah. use a solid arrowhead regular, regular to represent control. Oh, so yeah. what's your thought on that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another difference where I know, I know. really uh -huh. what do you see is maybe it's not different <laughs> what's actually happening compared I mean, with the, the electric the circuits. Uh-huh. <laughs> The only thing that's consistent, it seems, is the blunt end for yeah. repression. <laughs> Everything else is, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, I've also used, uh, I've, I've used filled arrow for mass transfer and filled circle for um, regulation. <laughs> so you used filled arrow for regulation, empty circle for mass transfer. Yeah, this it's, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm not, a, although I was on the paper, I'm not a big fan of SPGN. It's not very no, it's, it's really hard to when you when you really use their uh you know notation it's almost become unreadable you it know uh, it's not as clean as you see with this figure here no uh -huh. that's my problem with it as well yeah i think we need different levels of uh, visualization you need a very minimal schematic so when you look at it you get an idea quickly and then you can add on biological attributes like whether it's a complex is it a phosphorylation? Because you, you're really not, you know, when you're just looking at the network, you really don't care what the molecular mechanism is sometimes. You just want to know what's what's the, you know, information flow going on. And um, I think, I mean, they tried to do some of that, but 
haven't really quite worked out, but yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Other questions, comments? I have a lot, but I can have the conversation with Herbert anytime. So I don't <laughs> yeah, want to monopolize yeah. them. Yeah. Um. Well, I have one comment yeah. regarding the, the problem of uh, having linearities or non linearities in the regulatory networks, yeah. but which really is bringing water to my meal, obviously. But uh, I'm a cell biologist with a great interest in mod mathematical modeling, etc. In one sense, if you do experiments, uh, we have now tools uh, that can tell us very well if some input correspond to a certain output and what is the kind of rate that we're going to find. And in this case, well, we can figure out if we have two possibilities mostly, or it goes linearly or semi-linearly in a way that is yeah. okay, approximately linear, yeah. or something else happened. Yeah. Yeah, there aren't many, there aren't many behaviors. There's a limited number. Something unexpected. Well, I mean, it's, it's linear. We the unexpected, I mean, for, for the unit processes, there's only linear, hyperbolic, and sigmoid are the most common. Now, when you combine those together, you may get different behaviors, but... Um, um, Let, let's say that uh, having an experiment that gives us something unexpected is where yeah. we have to look for the nonlinearities. If we get what we expect, we can be happy and say, okay, at least this right. part can be accepted as a kind of yeah. linear or semi-linear system and yeah. then adding up to the rest of the network. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, yeah. If you see something unexpected, then you've got some more work to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, I think it was uh, interesting that's almost like a, uh, with that, that uh, negative feedback with like a high loop gain uh, by itself, uh, right, through like simple binding, um, the traditional way we're seeing this, like a ligand binding to a receptor, you always assume that the ligand is always in excess, right? And then you, the, the, bind, the, the, the bond form uh, follows, as Michaelis mentioned, uh, oh, yeah. kinetics. Yeah. Uh, right. But then uh, uh, Jane just mentioned that, uh, you know, on the, in the genome where a, for example, a nuclear receptor, the number of nuclear receptor, whatever, a transmission factor can be fewer than the, the number of available binding sites. And, and one, so when you when you don't consider these these uh, these ligand or anything that's as a li limiting factor, then you do actually end up with a more linear response in terms of those bond form. Uh -huh. uh, compared with the, with the traditional uh, way we're, we're we're doing this modeling, uh, essentially it's it's like the, the the bond form can be rising linearly with the total amount of ligand in the system. Not the free one we usually talk about, and oh, yeah, then yeah, it just yeah, then yeah. it just clip off as and it just stops saturated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So I think that's a that's neat. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, uh -huh. that's what you're saying. Yes, mm -hmm. that's actually also a model for um, uh, one model for ultra sensitivity where you have only so many binding sites as they as they fill up, it slowly increases. And then um, suddenly, when when all the binding sites are occupied, you get a sudden rise in the ligand because there's nothing more to absorb it. So you get this right. very sharp it change does, at that point. Case, uh, and you get this ultra sensitive response. So it must be yeah. shown experimentally, actually. Well, this happens in 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 the toxicology that we deal with. So when you look at acetaminophen toxicity in the liver. Acetaminophen is metabolized by CYP2E1 to NAPT, which binds irreversibly to glutathione. As long as you produce less NAPT than you have glutathione, you're fine. Oh, yeah. The cells recover. Yeah. If you at any time produce enough NAPT that you eliminate the glutathione, the cell dies, period. Oh, yeah. And it dies in a particularly pro-inflammatory messy way and so uh, you have this this tremendous threshold sensitivity which is yeah. uh, you say napkin is very toxic but in fact 
uh, if you're below the threshold of toxicity, it basically does no harm at all. And above the threshold of toxicity, it kills the cell, period. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, a, there's, there's a tiny window where there's some variability of damage. Yeah. But yeah. essentially, you, it, you, you have almost a Boolean switch from, uh, and that level of sensitivity depends on all sorts of things. Uh, and that makes it very difficult because the this, 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 this switching behavior where an app can becomes lethal, but the level at which it becomes lethal is dependent on all sorts of other things. It means it's yeah. very hard to calculate a safe threshold. It's funny how such a simple mechanism can, you know. The scramble competition is always a, such a big effect. Yeah. 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 All right. Other comments or questions for Herbert? Lots of lots of interesting things to try. Well, we got we're preparing two papers at the moment. Um, um, one is on some new properties for these you know, multiple phosphorylation sites, and another one on a general statement of, des of uh, design, how to how to uh, how to deconstruct design in complicated networks. So. Mm. Yeah, uh, another thing, just while you're talking about the phosphorylation, I think you mentioned this. Uh, maybe some of the phosphorylation are just uh, needs to be constitutively there. It's not regulated the phosphorylation. Yeah, Once the protein is flesh made, it need to be <laughs> phosphorylated to be function. But that process itself is just a constitutive, right? Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, it could be a way of just of, of uh, creating a new state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do is with multiple phosphorylation, you can count uh, or you can integrate anyway. You can use it as an integrator. Whether that is used or not, is, nobody knows, but you could if you, if you wanted to use multiple phosphorylation sites as an integrator of a signal. So, you know, it basically sums up the signal as the phosphorylation increases. Yeah, I remember there was a paper that talked about multi-site phosphorylation, which accumulate all these... Uh... The negative charge, right? Uh huh. And yeah. so, and which actually recruit the protein to a uh, to a positive charged whatever protein anchored on the cell membrane and initiate the cell signaling. I don't remember it was a long time ago. Right, but some proteins are heavily phosphorylated. I mean, like like 15, 20 sites. No, it doesn't make any sense. So, and each one costs an ATP. It's not like it is for free. Yeah, and you, you maintain that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a one-time deal. You need to maintain that. Yeah, I was even talking to James over a message. I'm not a biologist, so uh, it seems to me that ph phosphorylation is just to change the electrical potential of a molecule. So to yeah, make it, can, yeah, that's one. That's another. To, that's another thing for it. Yeah, that's why it comes from forming these surfaces onto which things can then bind. Right. So, I mean, phosphorylation is quite a flexible uh, trick. You can do a lot with it, lots of things with it. Yeah. yeah. I also wanted to thank you because I, I love when, you know, someone is trying to present biology in a language that I understand because I also <laughs> come from electric, you know, electric and electronics. So you, I think it's you... a good background to have, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so my experience with electrical engineers is they good ones anyway, they have an intuitive feel for circuits. They look at it and they'll tell you, yeah, I know why that transistor is there, why that resistor is there in terms of a system. Right. They don't think of it in terms of single things. They really think of it in terms of it's there because it's needed it's serving. to be this thing in the whole thing. Yeah. And it biologists are not, not you know, some well, molecular biologists are not very good at that, to be honest, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a similar experience. Uh, you know, I kind of, I was on my training all of medical uh, biology, but I, I grew up with tink tinkling with a lot of these circuit boards, uh -huh. weathering things, making all these radios. So while I was teaching this system biology course, I always like to use the, like the AM radio, uh, like ah. this wire and diagram to show students what's going on, how the right. similarity, everything. Yes. And then remember there was a training course we did uh, like many years ago. And I was talking about all these negative feedback, proportional feedback, integral feedback, how those gain can uh, modulate the behavior. And everybody lost except one student came out from EPA. And she told me, I'm an engineering by training. This is 
stuff makes sense. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just like exactly what Joe you says there. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. This all makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Everyone else lost. I'll, I, I I'll think tell you how I rationalize. Uh huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Her. Uh, her. I think the all systems biologists have a good dose of uh, control theory and electrical engineering. Yeah, Probably I was ab- about to say that the way I rationalize evolution is it seems it's a brute force algorithm that finds steady states and that's where what we see and what fails we don't see. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. basically, you know, it, it's easy to translate like that, but implement something similar first yeah. require a lot of time, right? Because yes, this yeah. algorithm is running for who knows? Billions, billions yeah. of generations, yes. Yeah, I was doing a calculation the other day because I was arguing with an intelligent designer uh, online, and um, I, I did a calculation of how many bacteria have divided since uh, in the last million years, and it was a like gigantic number, planet wide. I said the number of experiments you can do is just massive, so it's not surprising you see evolution <laughs> and things that we design not to commit commit mistakes. It seems that it's you know, a feature, right? Like make a copy wrong because we need this to go different from what it is, right? It it, it promotes instability too, it seems, which is well, you want it to, you want it to be evolvable. You don't want it fixed. You want some flexibility. Yeah. Well, people, have, I mean, in robotics, people do evolutionary algorithms for control sometimes. And they come up with circuits that 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 nobody would ever design that work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And 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 when you put in things like transistors, which have nonlinear behavior, which of course they do, you wind up using the the, the circuit will wind the the evolutionary algorithms will come up with, with using the transistor in domains you don't normally do it. You'll use a highly nonlinear domain where you would avoid normally. The other, the other uh, thing they will do, they'll only use two leads sometimes. Yeah, they'll use it right. They'll they'll, they'll just use it as a as a as a pass through rather than an amplifier. Yeah. So 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 uh, because because evolution doesn't care about intelligibility. No. Uh, it cares about something that has a particular re- some response. Mm. Uh, so so. I think these are you've raised so many fundamental issues. It's really it's almost uh, it's impressive you haven't given it up. I almost gave up after I saw that paper from Colin Denko. No. To, 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 to uh, it was the thing that uh, there is uh, I think is Richard Dawkins that uh, goes even or instead of counting the number of bacteria, could count the number of uh, molecules of DNA, even small, that have replicated since the invention of DNA. And this seems to be probably one of the definition of what is kind of the most important bit. So the information that replicates. Oh, right. This is maybe probably even bigger numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Sauro, I, I wanted to ask you about, because you mentioned... Um, you know, that biological system plays with noise, but we on the electric system too, but we do that like very small. So we know exactly, exactly yeah. but for them is probably they have a big, a bigger range that they can operate, yep. but outside some range, we can probably expect that it wouldn't even work either. Right. Is that correct? I guess so. If it's too much noise, then yeah, there won't be any information at all, but I see noise as a, as a sort of second channel. In, in a cell because they can transmit information inside it to um, because the non, non-linear elements can distort the noise. And so there's an extra degree of freedom they have, which uh, we sort of eliminate in the electrical circuits. So you can take, for example, a perfectly stable system and add noise and it becomes unstable because it, it's, it, it, moves, it moves the steady state into a region of instability. Um, because of this, what's called stochastic focusing. So, I mean, when, years and years ago, like 20 years ago, I thought stochastic systems were just noisy versions of a deterministic one, but it's not always, that's not always the case. Uh, well, you can be actually qualitative like, chatter, like chatter don't exist to, if you don't have noise. Yeah, right, yeah. But it uh, actually moves the system to a completely different regime. Well, the other one, you, you talked about destabilization, but you could also have stabilization. So 
right? If you're balancing a pencil, that's an unstable fixed point. Yeah. You add noise to it, you can stabilize that fixed point. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so that, that's another very scary that. part of biology, is yeah. the noise. Um, there, there are also a reason noise. I remember there's a, a few papers uh, that a few years ago, they're using this information uh, theory, basically saying with all these noise, the, 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 the channel capacity, that's the term they use, right? It's only like a one or two bits. Yeah, no, that's, that's wrong. Uh, so what do you think on that? That's been that? refuted, I think. Um, the problem with that study was uh, they looked at the culture, cell culture, and so every... And so what the one bit is the one bit of uh, the average in the entire culture. If you look at individual cells, there's a lot more bits. So the channel the, capacity in a single cell is a lot more than one. Or the, uh, I tend to think the opposite. Like, it's, it, it, like say at a single cell level, they, they can only differentiate either low or high signal. No, but at the right. aggregate, uh, then the other way around. you can have more granularities in there. I think it's the other way around. Uh, the other way around? You should pick two. Um, Steve Andrews here, uh, you know, the Smolden guy. He uh, he was, uh, there was a paper he said that was published after that that refuted it. And he also did some work on it, and he, but he hasn't published the paper that also refutes this idea that there's only one bit of information. And he says it's because the, uh, the original study, they did a population. And so it smeared out the, uh, the, because the, every cell is behaving slightly differently. But each cell is behaving as it should, but each cell is slightly different. And so if you were to take the, the average of all the cells, it looks really bad. But if you take an individual cell, an individual cell is actually quite good at measuring things. Okay. I mean, it has to be really, you know. Um, but they're all slightly different. So, um, but uh, I mean, I can... Um, like but there are, but I think it all depends on the right the situation. There are a lot of R non response at a single cell level, but then there are yeah all, yeah no that, there are on off responses too, uh -huh. but they're also graded as responses. Graded responses. Well, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, when that curved paper came out, it says one bit. That didn't make any sense. Why have all this complexity just to transmit one bit? I thought they were because they're. <laughs> They're thinking that each cell will be just a, a binary unit, and then the whole thing. Uh, why, why, why have thousands of proteins just for one for one bit? <laughs> that didn't make any sense to me. I was suspicious of it the minute it came out. So, but anyway, I mean, the place that coding theory becomes interesting is in spatial pattern, oh, yeah. where you have what you want to have a positional information in the tissue. And the, the, the signal is noisy. And the question is, how do you know where you are to differentiate appropriately? Oh, yeah. Um, and, and what you see biologically is you don't have one gradient. It's not FGF8. It's not TGF beta. You have six, seven, eight, nine, ten different signaling molecules that seem to be doing something very similar. Oh, yeah. And it's not just that they're adding up. It's not a one, it's not a counting one over root n, right? situation. The gradients are subtly different. And there is some theory that shows that there are, in fact, optimal structures for those gradients to provide spatial information in the presence of noise. Um, now, that's not inside a single cell, and it's specifically in the context of spatial gradients. Yeah. But, but uh, the theory seems there to work, which surprised me a bit. In other words, you calculate, if I have n signals, and I want them, I draw some zigzags, and I want to know what zigzag should I draw to have maximal positional accuracy given a certain level of noise. Usually the way the, usually the, the biological choices are pretty close to the optimum. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty surprising. Uh, we have friends at, at Purdue who are working on the cochlea. Mm -hmm. And in the cochlea, it's very stereotyped. There are exactly three cells of this kind, and then exactly four cells of this kind, and exactly four cells of this kind, and so on. And that information is passed through gradients, which are very noisy. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you get precise decisions of that kind mm -hmm. in the presence of these fuzzy gradients? And the answer is that if you have enough signals and they have the right spatial relationships, you can do it. Mm -hmm. I would say the answer. A possible answer 
because there could be the idea that they reinforce each other at intersections or something right but it's not just that you have the same signal in other words you have to have them be different they have to be different. yeah 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 uh and so uh things that you see in drosophila although drosophila is a crappy choice for as a model you get pair rule genes and all of these complicated multiple gradients that seem to be you will say why why do you need zigzags of this scale and this scale and this scale mm -hmm. when they all seem to be giving essentially redundant information and there are particular combinations of them that are very effective at overcoming noise issues and some of that Okay, well, I think, I go. I think this was a great discussion. Thank you, no, Herbert, thanks. for coming and talking to us. Yeah, no, really no problem. Thanks it. a lot, everybody. Okay, Good. Yeah, thank you. Care. Thank you very much. Yeah, Goodbye. bye, guys.